Glad to see everyone on screen. I will begin this special call session for the Board of Trustees of the Spring Independent School District is officially called to order on Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020. On March 16th, 2020, Governor Greg Abbott granted a request by Attorney General Ken Paxton to temporarily suspend a limited number of open meeting laws to the extent necessary to allow telephonic and video conference meeting in response to the COVID-19 and coronavirus. Accordingly, due to health and safety concerns, this meeting is being conducted by video conference. The time is now 7.02 p.m. Board members present, Winfred Adams Jr., Kelly Hodges, Deborah Jensen, Justine Durant, Don Davis, and myself, Rhonda Newhouse. I would like to ask everyone to mute their microphones unless speaking. Thank you. We will now hear from our superintendent of schools, Dr. Rodney Watson. Uh, thank you, President Newhouse and other trustees. First of all, good evening. It's great to see you all again. Um, it's somewhat hard to believe that we're already in June and we are going to be presenting the budget tonight. It seems like time just continues to fall, uh, fall away and go faster and faster. So earlier this month, uh, Ms. dunn Oldfield presented our scenario planning protocols, which outlined the planning process uh, for student learning in the fall. Um, our collaborative cross-functional teams, they are continuing to develop their micro plans, uh, which will outline how we will serve our students and our community in August. Uh, today, we launched our parent survey that will gather important feedback as we continue planning for school in August. And tomorrow, we will launch our staff survey to gather input from them as well. Uh, we, we know that you support and believe that community and staff feedback is central to our planning process. So we really encourage all of our families to take advantage and to fill out those surveys and to uh, get that information back to us. TA provided new guidance today at three o'clock regarding attendance and enrollment, as well as public health considerations. Um, our administrative team will be reviewing all the guidance documents um, this week, and we will include those recommendations in our presentation to you all next week on July 30th. Um, Anne's gonna be sharing a few of the updates that we uh, pulled out of the presentation today, and she'll share that in her budget presentation this evening. We're also excited uh, to offer two summer learning at home programs that, are, that run uh, Monday through Thursday with the first scheduled for June 10th through the 30th and the second July 7th through the 28th. Um, right now we have about 5,800 students that have registered and it's been really interesting. We've had uh, students reg registered for our morning session as well as our evening session. And so we'll continue to provide you updates um, regarding how that's going um, at our next meeting. Tonight, Ms. Westbrooks will present our third budget review and consider adopting the budget for the Student Success Initiative and Accelerated Instruction. In addition, we're going to hold a public hearing for the 2020-21 budget that um, you all and the administration have been working on. There's quite a few items on our agenda tonight, and so we're excited uh, to share with you where we are as well as um, the planning that we're doing for the future. Uh, that does conclude my announcements and look forward to a great meeting. trying to unmute myself. Uh, Dr. Watson, I think in your report, you mentioned our next meeting being July 30th. June the 30th. I think you meant June the 30th. Yes, June the 30th. Yes, June 30th, week, thank yes. you. Okay, for our next item, I'd like to recognize our Chief Financial Officer, Ann Westbrooks. Good evening, thank you, President Newhouse. Good evening, members of the board. And so we're going to start off this evening with our third and final review of the 2019-2020 budget. And then we'll flow into the proposed budget for the 2021 school year. So if you'll turn with me to the, or scroll with me to the first item that is um, the third budget review, the first agenda item that you all have. 
and as is our process, we go through each of the fund types and discuss some of the large changes that are occurring and the resulting fund balance in each of, each of those fund items. So we'll begin on the first page and that's with a general fund. And so on the revenue side of general funds, we're looking at a decrease of a net amount of eight point, just under $8.3 million. And so that decrease is largely significantly made up of the decrease in the state revenue for the foundation school program. So at the last board meeting we had, we discussed what's called the ESSER funds, which is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. That's a part of the CARES Act. And those funds are going to be used to ensure that school districts are held harmless for the, the enrollment and the average daily attendance for students. So that in essence, when you add the general fund state revenue and the ESSER funds together, the district will receive the full funding for the 2019-20 school year. So what you're seeing happen here is the decrease on the general fund side for the revenue that will be offset using those ESSER funds that we'll see later on the, the special revenue side. So that's the large decrease that you see there for state aid. The next decrease is we are anticipating a, a small decrease in our um, total property tax revenue collections for the year. And so we're adjusting that down by about $1.3 million. And so that's sluggish collections, but it's also refunds. And so we, we give quite a bit of refunds and you see those coming to you throughout the year. And what happens with that is when we do our property value audits and we settle up, we eventually get those funds back through state aid. So that is um, what we're seeing happening with our property tax collections. The other large item there is the TRS on behalf. And as you recall from previous meetings and previous budget reviews, the TRS on behalf is basically an accounting entry. It's the portion of the TRS that is actually paid by the state, but of course we have to book that entry, that offsetting revenue and expenditure on um, the, the district's books. So, and that's just, to accommodate our total anticipated salary amount for the year. And then the other item of note here is an increase in interest earnings of $442,000. Now that's something that we'll see this year, but it's unlikely that we'll see that type of an increase in interest income in, in the next uh, few years as the economy stabilizes. So those are the, the notable increases to the revenues on the general fund. And if we go to the next page, we'll see the, the changes in expenditures. And so on the expenditure side, we're showing an increase of $6 million. And of that $6 million, 5 million of it is the budget. We're actually putting the budget for the coronavirus um, COVID-19 expenditures that we've incurred since the beginning of the pandemic. And so as we discussed in previous board meetings, that was um, money that was for technology devices and devices that we've, we've purchased and we've already begun um, or we have distributed those out to our students. So that's the largest portion of the total cost that we're budgeting for there. But we have had some personal protective equipment for our employees that are interfacing with the community. And so that's things such as masks and cleaning supplies, additional gloves, those sorts of, those sorts of costs, as well as premium pay which the board approved for our staff that was coming in and working when everyone else was, was still on remote, in, in a remote learning, such as our child nutrition employees that have been working the curbside meals. Um, that's an example, but they're not in this, they're in the child nutrition fund. So that's the $5 million there. And just as a reminder, yes. Books. Yes. Mm -hmm. My apologies, I got lost. Can you give me your page number? Sure. Um, if someone could, I'm sorry, I don't have the agenda packet up and following that. If someone could give the, the agenda packet page number. We're on page two in, in the um, review packet. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Mr. Ann, I want to make sure you're with, with me before I continue. Are you, are you okay? You're on the same page with us? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
I see your beautiful smile, but I can't see your thumbs up. <laughs> so um, that's the COVID-19. And, and I just wanted to mention that um, we have the Coronavirus Relief Fund that will uh, provide some reimbursement of the costs that we incurred. Those, the methodology for refund or excuse me for the reimbursement came out and we know that we can get reimbursed for up to 75 percent but those funds haven't been made available yet we do know now that the texas department of emergency management will oversee the reimbursement process but we're still waiting on the details to come out regarding that process and then the other notable increase on the expenditure side is the one million dollars um, the expenditure offset for the trs on behalf. And so that is uh, the major changes in both revenues and expenditures for the general fund. In the Child Nutrition Fund, there I have was... A question, Ms. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Um, so there's been some talk in the news about some federal funding that the state received that uh, many districts anticipated would be coming to the districts that did not. Where does that shake out in our revenues and expenditures? That would be the ESSER funds that we were that we were mentioning. And so that was part of the CARES Act. And so it's not additional revenue. Instead, those revenues are being used to offset the total amount that we would have received for state aid. So we're being held harmless, so to speak. But it's, it's um, split between the general fund and those federal funds that we received through the ESSER. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so in child, the Child Nutrition Fund, so no additional or no changes to the revenue, but there was an increase of just over a million dollars. And of, that's also for the COVID-19 related expenditures for the Child Nutrition Program. And they are working with Texas Department of Agriculture to um, pursue any reimbursement that's available for those expenditures as well. On the debt service side, we had about $850,000 increase in revenue due to interest earnings and um, property tax collections adjustments over on the debt service side of things. The large transaction that we have here that's um, in expenditures and financial sources, other financial sources, is for our two. 2020 bond refunding that you all approved um, back at the May board meeting, I believe maybe April board meeting, and we had a successful transaction in the midst of everything that was going on. We had a very successful transaction and, and we uh, submitted a write up about the transaction and the net present value savings that we had um, in the board update. So that's the budget for that item for the debt service. On the special revenue side, we had a net increase of uh, 6.4 million in both revenues and expenditures. And to your question, Mr. Adams, there's $9.4 million that is budgeted for ESSER here in that special revenue fund. And it's offset by some adjustments that we had to make in some of our other, other federal funds. So that you'll see the 9.4 million that's in the details in here that's offsetting that um, 8.9 or so that we talked about on the general fund side of things. So I, I believe we were all anticipating some, some new money and it, and it came in the form of offsetting money to answer your question. Um, the capital projects fund is the next one. And there we had an increase of just under $65,000 again for interest earnings and we also had an increase in expenditures of two point, just under 2.2 million and an offsetting, similar offsetting increase of 2.1 million. And that's, if you recall, the sale of property for the Imperial Valley Drive property that we had over there. And so those funds, since the property was purchased with bond proceeds, we had to uh, put those, the revenue associated with that back in the capital projects fund. So that's where you see that, that $2 million. It's the revenue from the sale and then the allocation of those funds on the expenditure side. And on the next page is the staffing allocations. And so this is the third and final review. And, and typically at this point in time, it's mostly just cleanup and corrections and adjustments that of position moves that's happened all throughout 
the year that we haven't captured in previous reviews. And so the total impact to the staffing allocations is a net decrease of 1.5 positions. And so if, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, you In your review, you answered several of my questions. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, I did have questions on the first page on the revenues, and it said we're getting an increase of $50,000 on uh, our federal revenue for E-rate. Uh, yes. Can you explain what that is? E-rate is a federal program that allows us to receive reimbursement for things such as technology pur purchases. And so this is a portion that's in the general fund for uh, technology purchases or sometimes it's just technological um, resources that we have. Now, we receive a much larger amount in federal E-rate that offset some of our uh, bond purchases, technology purchases that were purchased through the bond. So it's it's a federal program that just helps make sure that, that funds flow to school districts to help offset the cost of technology resources. Uh, the other question I had was under expenditures. Um, I know that we've been uh, spending quite a bit of uh, money to offset uh, instruction in a different um, venue, shall I say. Uh, and uh, for these employees, it looks like all we've done for them was personal protective equipment. Uh, I've been concerned lately because I've heard from teachers who say they don't have the network connections or even the... Um, oh, uh, home office kind of equipment they need to run a classroom from their home. Uh, have you heard anything like that? Anybody? I know, yes, Dr. Wyatt. And go ahead, get, go ahead and talk about just some of the comments in your staffing committee and then we can talk about where we're going from there. Yes, and so those, those types of comments have come up throughout this, the closure. And so, and I know that we've, we've had some outside entities that have spoken to us about some concerns that have come up. And so as part of the scenario planning, we have acknowledged the fact that we do have not just, we've been focused on students and their internet capabilities, but we've also realized that we do have staff that have some limitations with theirs as well. And so that's part of this full-fledged technology plan that we're putting together to see what our needs are and uh, what funds we can we can address those needs with. And so we have just recently begun the process of purchasing some hotspots that um, I think we we got two blocks of a thousand hotspots. And so the plan was to issue those out to our students that had some internet limitations. But as we continue to move through the scenario planning and we see the need, then that might be an option for our employees as well if, if they do not have internet access or the capability to provide the remote instruction. I don't want to get off the topic of budget, but I do want to mention that uh, Don and I were in a meeting uh, with uh, the Legislative Action Committee for TASB, and uh, one of their priorities that they're uh, pushing forward is um, uh, the state reimbursing districts for COVID-related uh, expenses for students. And I've been trying to push very hard with that group to include teachers. Uh, so I just want to make that uh, mention that we're thinking about the teachers too. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then on, it's on page 12 of the, the third budget review document, and it has Schedule G at the top. I wanted to bring that schedule to your attention. There's lots of detail that goes behind the numbers that I just uh, quoted to you all, but this particular one I wanted to bring to your attention. So it's on, it's on page 12 of the third budget review document. Does that everyone see that with Schedule G at the top? Okay, so I wanted to bring this one to your attention specifically because um, over, over the last five years or so, 
you all have done such an amazing job of helping maintain the fiscal responsibility of the district. And so in years when we've had surplus, we've transferred a portion of that surplus over to this, to this budget. And this is a capital projects budget. So it's allowed us the opportunity to address capital needs as they arose when maybe we didn't have funds over in the current budget and general fund. And so you can see many of the projects that are on here should be familiar discussions and decisions and approvals that we've received. But specifically the last number that's on this page that's listed as district wide capital projects slash technology refresh. Those are funds that are from the Imperial Valley cell, but also from uh, residual funds that we've transferred from general funds because we've had surplus years. And so that four that four million five hundred and ninety two thousand dollars. That's the number I wanted to draw your attention to. So as we're we're working through the technology plan to to address the needs of our students going into 2021. The goal is uh, at this point in time to get as many devices and get as close to one to one as possible as funds will allow as well as to address other additional technology needs that we know we'll need going into the 2021 year. And Dr. Jensen, to your question about internet service for our teachers and, and additional supports that we need to provide there, this is a pot of funds that we have available in order to address those needs. And so this is the, the, four, the 4 4.592. So I wanted to bring that to your attention, especially when when Ms. Dunn O'Field and the rest of the team that did the scenario planning, when you start seeing those scenarios and you see some of the needs that arise as part of the scenario planning for 2021, I wanted you to be aware of that, that pot of funds that are available to help address those needs and the technology plan that's being developed to purchase devices and, and additional resources that we know we'll need um, going forward. Trustee Westbrooks, can you speak to the totals on this page? Yes, ma'am. That just in grand total. Mm -hmm. Do we have that available? No, ma'am. Not those are projects that have been, with the exception of the the four point six million. The other projects have actually been funded. Okay. So, and we've we've expended those dollars already. So the four point five million that's at the bottom, those are funds that are still unallocated at this point that we can use to make some decisions to help support our um, projects for our learning for the next year. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that is the third and final budget review for 2019-20. Let's just ask if there are any additional questions before we move to the next agenda item. Uh, Ms. Westbrooks, I have a few questions. Okay. Uh, we have detailed information, and I know this will be shared with the community, about uh, what kind of funds each school gets. Uh, could you address uh, the process that we go through to make sure that uh, the schools uh, are involved in requesting these funds and how they're allocated to make sure we have equitable education for students in Spring ISD? Yes, ma'am. The, the dollars that are available to the campus are allocated on a per pupil allocation. So they, and that's the methodology that we attempt to use in, in most cases. And so we we do $62 per pupil at the high school, 55 per pupil at middle school, and I believe 41 at the elementary level. And so they receive their discretionary funds, which is their supplies, materials, and those sorts of dollars are on a per pupil allocation amount. And in addition to that, they receive tutorial funds that are on top subs dollars for their substitute. And so there's an allocation for those, those dollars as well for substitute cost, and it's based on the number of teachers they have on their campus and the average cost um, of a substitute per day. Um, let's see, and then there's other funding sources such as uh, state comp ed that they receive, like I mentioned, for tutorials. Now that those amounts are based upon the number of at-risk students that they have at the campus. So 
in most cases, like I said, it's based upon uh, per pupil or it's based upon level. And there are some funds that we give based on a flat amount for elementary, a flat amount for middle school and a flat amount for high school. And then um, when opportunity arises, like when we had the one-time cost in the fall, the, the large approval that you all were able to approve for us in, in October, we did reach out to our high school specifically and said, okay, what, what are some needs? What are some things that you, you just, you need to get your hands on? And so they gave us list. And of course the list always exceed the dollars available, but I expect nothing less. And when you get the opportunity, put it out there. So, um, that that's for the most part how we, how we go about um, allocating dollars. Uh, and also below the schools in the list on the budget, there are uh, specific departments across Spring ISD to make us uh, provide services to schools and students. Uh, there was uh, one that I was uh, needing a little more definition for, and that is district-wide expenses. Apparently we spent over $26 million for that. And I just wanted to know a little bit more how, where that $26 million is going. The largest portion of that is benefits cost. It's, it's benefits that are budgeted and district-wide. And so um, unemployment cost, um, group term life insurance, group life insurance cost, um, health insurance, all of those, the benefits are, are budgeted there. That makes up the largest portion of that amount that's in district wide. Also our property insurance that we saw an astronomical increase in, in our property insurance this year, that full amount is budgeted in district wide. Um, trying to think of what that, that explains it right there. Okay. <laughs> those, are the, those are the big buckets that's in district wide. And we do that because it makes more sense to see that we have things that touch all of the district um, facilities and, and um, operations captured there as opposed to if we had insurance and finance, you'd be like, why is finance getting an extra $3 million? That's not an appropriate place. So that's why we put it in district wide. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Okay. If there are no further questions, then Ms. Newhouse, I'll move to the next item, which is um, we're moving into the 2021 uh, budget adoption. And so the first item is a requirement that we have as a part of the Student Success Initiative and Accelerated Instruction that requires us to approve the budget that will address our, our students and provide additional accelerated instruction for our students who failed to perform satisfactory. Satis Ms. Westbrook, <laughs> let me ask you a question. Yes, ma'am. Before you go into this, I think each one of these will require a separate motion from uh, an approval from the board. So uh, rather than complete all of them and come back, let's stop and do the uh, third budget review first and make sure we have no other discussion or questions first and then go to the next one. Yes, so, thank you. Uh, let me ask the board. I will uh, entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees approve the third budget review as presented by the administration. Madam President, I move that the Board of Trustees approve, approve the third budget review as presented by the administration. I Do we second have a that, Trustee Duran. I see how just a second. Okay. Uh, it's been moved by Deborah Jensen, second by Justine Durant, that the Board of Trustees approve the third budget review as presented by the administration. Is there any discussion? I, I have a question. Um, I'm looking through here for the line item uh, for what we provide for social services, wraparound services. I know we do some work with mental health. So I'm looking to see what we're spending on that right now. So we have, I think the best, easy, um, quick view of that is going to be in the function total. Um, on page 11, 
of your document that has Schedule F at the top. <clears throat> you can see the total amount for social work services that is listed there. And that's in the general fund, but then there's also dollars that are allocated in the Title IV federal fund that addresses mental health as a part of the school health and safety initiative portion of Title IV. So with general fund, we do have a social work position that um, is in the district that works with some of our teen parents and, and, and um, those types of services, but that, that gives you the total of what's happening in general fund for that, for that function. So I just want to be clear what I'm looking for, because that's a piece of it. But so there's social work, there's mental health services, uh, there's guidance counselors, like that, like all of that. Um, yes. And counseling has its own function that's that's listed here as well. Right. I see. It. Yes, sir. So that's the total cost of all of our counselors across the district, uh, behavior specialists, anyone that that um, give those type of as you mentioned, wraparound services to our students. And right now, our ratio of counselors to students, I know it's higher than the state average. Um, At the high school, we have um, a ratio of 382 to 1 at the high school level. At elementary, we have one counselor. And at middle school, I believe we have one per grade level. And Dr. H, isn't our ratio lower than the state? You're yeah, mid. actually, actually, uh, Mr. Adams, our ratio is lower than the state. Um, huh? It were the last time at 475. So that's what I, I meant to say. How we have a higher proportion. Yeah, we're saying the same thing. I just, okay. I don't, but we're doing better than the state in terms of our ratio is what I was trying to say. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. And that was actually a goal of you all a few years ago when we were going through redoing the counseling, wanting to bring that ratio down. And so the board um, took action for us to be able to do that. And the actual. Yes, we did. And it's one that I'm really excited about because at one time we were at almost 600 to one at the high school. At the high school. When the mm -hmm. state, I believe, recommends, they actually recommend 250. Mm -hmm. So um, we're better than the state. And a whole lot better than we used to be. Um, would I like to see more, of course, <laughs> uh, but uh, we're definitely trending in the right direction. That's, tr that's true. It's, so that's money well spent. I just want to emphasize that like what our counselors are doing for our students um, is really, really critical. And so where we can pinch a penny to put over into wraparound services and social services, I always believe is money well spent. I would like to say, with our middle school challenges, I may like to see us take a look at doing something different there. Because one per grade level, is that sufficient? Well, I think one of the things that we're continuing to do is not only have you all done that, um, you all were one of the leaders in getting a director of mental health um, counseling for the district. And so this does not include the grant funds and partnerships and MOUs that you all have been approving all year um, that Dr. Zimmerman has been able to go out and secure for students at middle school and high school and actually elementary school as well. And so there's many more um, structures that she's already working on now for the fall um, as well. And so we'll continue pushing that as well. And so I think, I think we've, we've been the leader in providing um, um, social and emotional learning for kids and counseling needs for kids. And our director of mental health counseling is doing a phenomenal job of getting additional services free or through an MOU. And just another... Sorry. Can we put a question on what we offer at a middle school level and um, look at that later? Absolutely. And I believe Trustee Hodges is trying to speak, so I'll yield to her. Yeah, I just had a question. I'm glad you brought that up about the MOUs because I noticed um, the last meeting when we approved some of those MO MOUs were for mental health. How does that factor into the budget this third uh, budget that we just looked at. Where is that line? Where, where are those in the line item? I believe those are typically um, like in-kind type relationships and there's no dollars tied to them. It's more okay. services that we're being able to take advantage of due to those partnerships. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
And Ms. Westbrooks, and um, just wanted to add, we just approved, I think what you were thinking about, Ms. Hodges, is our social workers, our partnership with KAIS. And so they're not only able to um, uh, provide services, but also secure services for the students and their families. And this is all around social services um, for every student and their family. Thank you for that, Dr. Hinojosa. And that those amounts, Ms. Hodges, those are listed in the on page 11. It's included in the cost for guidance and counseling for the KAIS workers, yes. The only other quick point I wanted to make with the, the counseling ratio is that 382 to 1 is our general counseling uh, ratio at the high schools, but we also have at-risk counselors that we're able to provide through our state comp ed funding. We have uh, CTE counselors that we provide through um, uh, CTE funding, and we also have career uh, counselors as well. So, so that helps bring that ratio even lower. Um, overall. That was an excellent point. I forgot all about that. Yes, that's huge. That is huge. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, I will now poll the board members for their vote to approve the third budget review as presented by the administration. Winfred Adams, Jr. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Need to unmute yourself, Ms. Durant. Aye. <clears throat> Something caught in my throat. Aye. Can you Thank hear me? Thank you. Don, Don Davis, yes. Don Davis. I knew no Mr. Davis was having some microphone problems. Okay, he may not be able to come back on with us. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, vote aye. So the motion carries. We have um uh, I guess one absent and one, uh, actually two absents. I should call Mr. Davis an absent there. So the motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Westbrooks. Uh, please continue with your next item. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for bringing me into Tuesday mode. I was in work session mode. Okay. <laughs> so our next item is the Student Success Initiative and Accelerated Instruction. And that is a part of the student um, that is necessary in order for us to provide that accelerated instruction for our students who have not passed um, their state exams. And so we're required to before we approve the budget, we're, we're required to approve this portion of the budget that sets aside those funds to provide the interventions as needed. And so as part of our state compensatory education funds, we set aside funds for those tutorials, in addition to other funds that are not in the general fund, but this portion is $351,000 and it is included in the proposed 2021 budget that we'll hear of in just a moment. Any questions, anyone? Ms. Westbrooks, is this uh, the SSI initiative specifically to tutor uh, kids to pass, the, is it the TSI? Um, it's for students that didn't pass their end of course exams. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's the funds are set aside for tutorials and in general that also address students that didn't pass those exams. Uh, another exam, okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, I will now entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020-2021 Spring Independent School District Budget for Student Success Initiative and Accelerated Instruction. 
Madam President, I move that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020-2021 Spring Independent School District budget for student success initiative and accelerated instruction. Do we have a second? Madam President, I second the motion. Thank you. It's been moved by Winfred Adams, second by Deborah Jensen. Madam President, can I ask a question before we move on? Uh, yes, ma'am, just a moment. Let me finish my line there. It's been moved by uh, Winfred Adams and second by Deborah Jensen that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020-2021 Spring Independent School District budget for student success initiative and accelerated instruction. And now uh, questions, please, or comments, Ms. Durant. My question was around the uh, ninth grade centers. Do we have anything included in here for those and what direction are we taking? Are you speaking specifically, specifically, Ms. Durant, to the Student Success Initiative budget or the, the larger budget as a whole? The larger budget as a whole. I need yeah. to hold my question. Yes, ma'am. We'll, we'll, we'll hold my question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you there, Ms. Westbrooks. So uh, any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, I will now poll the board members for their vote to approve the 2020-2021 Spring Independent School District budget for a student success initiative and accelerated instruction. Winfred Adams, Jr. Aye. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Donald Davis. Donald Davis. Aye. And Rhonda Newhouse, aye. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, again, we have one absent. Thank you. So we will continue. Our next item is the public hearing for the 2020. 2021 Spring Independent School District budget. At this time, I would like to again recognize our Chief Financial Officer, Ann Westbrooks. Thank you, President Newhouse. Okay, so we will dive into our public hearing for the 2021 budget. And just to start off, uh, we know with every budget, any budget the year that we're in, even in one with great uncertainty as this one, that we're building our budget based upon some estimates and some assumptions. And so here I want to point out all of the items that were the figures and, and things that we're using to come up with our estimates for this budget. And so for starters with our enrollment, we are projecting that our enrollment will be relatively flat going into 2021. And so the en enrollment projection that we're using to build the budget is 35,443 students. And that in our new environment is inclusive of all of our Spring ISD students, whether they're attending school in person on campus or remotely from home. Where another big component of our calculation for our revenue that supports our budget is the average daily attendance that you hear us refer to as ADA. And so as Dr. Watson alluded to earlier, we have received some additional guidance uh, from the TEA that we'll talk about in just a moment. And for our ADA calculation right now, we're using 32,266. Our next largest uh, funding revenue source is um, the tax, property tax values. And so, What's important when we calculate our state aid, of course, is our um, value that we receive from the comptroller's office. But initially, we base our budget upon our Harris County Appraisal District estimates that we receive in April 
every year. And so as discussed in an earlier board meeting, we did receive those values around April 30th and our value is 15 point, just under $15.5 billion. And that represents a 7.38% increase over the prior year. Um, for our tax rate, um, calculations for the, the next year. We're looking at a maintenance and operations tax rate of 93.77 cents. And as mentioned uh, previously, and as we saw as a result of House Bill 3, our maintenance and operations tax rate is largely dependent upon the amount of increase in our property values from year to year. And so our, our maintenance and operations property tax rate goes down as our values go up. So based upon the estimated values that we received in April, and based upon that increase in values, our m and rate would drop from what's currently now 97 cents down to 93.77 cents for the maintenance and operations. And then our interest in sinking, um, which supports our debt service fund, would drop from the now 46 cents down to 45 cents. And that's based upon the anticipated calculation um, of revenues that we'll receive with the new estimated values. And so we're looking at a total proposed tax rate and proposed is key because um, first of all, we're not approving the tax rate tonight. We're only discussing the tax rate that would be needed to support this budget. We'll approve the tax rate in October after we receive our certified values from the appraisal district in uh, late August. So the total proposed rate that we anticipate at this point is the $1.38.77, which is a decrease from our current rate, which is $1.43. So there is a process that's new this year, and it's to receive our maximum compressed rate from the Texas Education Agency. And the data collection for that begins in July and we'll receive that final rate uh, from TA in mid-August. So that's when we'll get our first view of, of what our actual rate will be. The way that the formula works with, um, with the tax rate as it relates to the property values is it, it just shifts the dollars from, um, from property taxes to state aid. So the overall resulting shouldn't be a big impact on our um, budget. It may just shift between um, state aid and the, and the M&O rate. So we'll talk more about the maintenance and operations rate at a later date. So to get to um, what we talked about earlier, and that is how will average daily attendance be calculated for the 2021 uh, fiscal year and so our school year and so dr watson and i attended the commissioner's presentation today at three o'clock so it's hot off the press and so tea released the faq as well as a presentation with some details about how attendance will be handled and how the funding calculation will will take place for next year and so the biggest point here is that the change in the funding formula is transitioning the state from a crisis response, which is what we were in for the second half of the spring semester, and moves us towards um, instruction. And so it's not just hold harmless, you know, everyone gets the funding. Now there's actual calculations that will take place and we have to show even more um, towards the instruction that's happening with our students. And so the new ADA system that's being unveiled is accommodating the new environment that we're in, which is the need for remote instruction and having that option available to our families so that if they're not comfortable sending their student to the brick and mortar building, their student can still receive um, remote instruction from home and the district would still receive funding to provide those that instruction to our students. So there's two methods that were discussed and method A is the synchronous instruction, which of course would require all of all of our students to be present at the same time virtually. So that's a live interactive course similar to the, the Zoom meeting that we're having right now. We're all in attendance, we're virtual, but we're participating, we're engaged, and we're moving along through the materials together. So that's a synch that synchronous instruction. And then method B would be asynchronous instruction, 
which wouldn't require all of the students to be online virtually at the same time, but instead they would have the ability to look at maybe pre-recorded instruction lessons or um, have some form of a self-paced online course. And so those are the two options and there's some attestations that the district will have to file. There's plans that we'll have to file. There's a lot more to, to um, this than just the simple words that we have here. And so we will bring more of that information to the board and Springs specific response and our plan on um, putting these, these new rules and guidelines into place. So you'll hear more about that. The one word that I did hear the commissioner say quite a bit, and that was the word grace. And that was comforting to hear grace because there's an understanding at the state level that it's going to take a lot in order to bring this new method to, um, to fruition. And so they did speak of over the first two six weeks, understanding that districts will be transitioning into these new instructional models. And so there will be some grace and, and basically a hold harmless in those first two six weeks when you compare those to the first two six weeks of 2019-20. So um, a lot of grace, a lot of flexibility, but a focus on true instruction happening and the accountability that goes along with that. So more information to come at the June 30th board meeting. Um, Ms. Westbrooks, I appreciate your um, ending comment that they said grace for the first couple of weeks, but was there any indication around the different methods that you gleaned from the conversation that would support impact to the budget for either method? Would one promote more over the other? Are they the same? I mean, did they give any you know, conversation around um, how it would reflect. We haven't gotten quite, and I, I do, I follow exactly what you're asking, and that's an excellent question, but we haven't done the deep dive into the, the two methods just yet to see whether there's more benefit to one or if there's more funding to one or the other. Just from some of the quick glance information, there is some required seat time and a certain amount of minutes depending on the level of um, students, whether it's pre-K through two versus third through um, six, there's a difference there. And we do know that the pre-K through two, the synchronous instruction, there's no funding generated there. So um, there, there's a lot more deep dive that we need to do. And so we'd like to bring that back in uh, next week so that we'll have a little bit more um, understanding and we'll have been able to ask some of the questions and, and hopefully have a lot more information available for you right. at that point. And the only thing that I would add to that is the bullet, the second to the last bullet when it says about grace. So we do um, respect the fact that they're giving us grace. However, my concern is what happens after the second or third six weeks. Um, after they're given that grace because mm -hmm. after, that period, after that period of time it's going to go back to something mm -hmm. more and so as superintendents and, and and organizations we are we are wanting them to extend that to the first semester because as we look at our budget that could be a big budget hit after that grace period depending upon where we actually are now based upon what we've already presented to you all in previous uh, presentations regarding what we did for the past three months we're definitely in line with both methods that they've already submitted and so we're in a very good place because we put those systems in place prior to but if you ask me my initial concern is what happens after the grace period and that's what um, Anna and i are going to have to really go back and look at um, because that could be a, a big budget uh, hit right there Thank you. And I recognize it was just one announcement today, but I know you both are pretty intuitive. And I just was wondering if you gleaned anything in addition, you know, so thank yeah, you. Gr Grace is only as good as until it runs out. Exactly. <laughs> and then what? Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, was um, there any discussion on attendance, keeping attendance in method A and B? Yes, and there are daily attendance requirements under both methods. Yes, and, and, there's, and, there's, and, there's, and there's stipulations as it relates to how do you get um, paid? How's that 88 count for day for day? So for example, the teachers cannot meet with kids and give them assignments and they check with them again on Friday. They made a big emphasis on 
um, kids working every day and showing progress every day. And that showing progress every, every day is going to yield ADA, which is the funding for, for that. And so that already coincides with the scenario planning that um, our teachers and, and um, administrative team has been working on. And so I felt good that they had already been looking into that. Um, and to some degree, as you saw with the presentation from the teacher at Beneke, we did that for the past three months anyway. But we've got to make sure that that's the same all the way across. So no longer can that be left up to um, a school or a building or a grade level. That has to be the expectation for every teacher in the district. And so those, that continuity is what we're going to be looking at as we go deeper into these documents. And you know, with our remote learning, are we sticking with the um, PBLs or are we using school Schoology? It's both. Well. Both. Yeah, it's both. Schoology is the platform that holds that and, and tracks our attendance, um, tracks the grades, and it's the communication tool back from students into parents. And the PBLs is the type of instruction that we're providing. Now, based upon the feedback from teachers, we are going to be providing PBLs, but they're, they're um, piloting it this summer. They're providing also more direct instruction because um, parents you know, some parents commented they enjoyed and liked the projects, um, but teachers said projects were good, but they know certain kids and all kids need more direct instruction or more direct teaching of TEKS. And so that's been included in the summer planning and we're piloting that to get the feedback to make those tweaks for the fall as well. So it's gonna be a combination of both. Um, the the hands-on experimental opportunities through project-based learning, but also the direct instruction and practice that kids need as well for skill development. I'm glad to hear that because I've received uh, comments and feedback the same from both staff, teachers, and parents. That's right. So it's, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I, I think I was probably one of those parents giving that feedback. <laughs> you were? <laughs> yes, you were, Mr. Adams? I have a question about our projected ADA. I did my little calculation here, and it looks like we're basing our projection on uh, getting 91% uh, attendance. Um, and I wondered, with all the work we did on Everyday Counts the last few years, I feel like we had been doing better than 92%. I'm not, somebody could refresh my recollection. I feel like we had gotten a bit higher than that. Um, and we, we are overall, we're, we're usually closer to about 93 to 93.5% when the whole year is done. Okay. Yes. And so um, the refined ADA, of course, which is what's listed there, is um, that's that's a rough calculation. And so, yeah, but we are closer to about 93, 93 and a half percent. Sometimes we get around 92 percent, but most of the time it's closer to 93, 93 and a half. Oh. And I think we're going to have different impacts that will affect um, attendance. So I, I think it's a, a good year to be a little more conservative with that. Okay. Uh, Debbie Jensen here. I have a couple of points. And uh, once again, not to get off the subject, but uh, during that Legislative Action Committee, one another of the priorities was, uh, I can tell you that TASB is um, uh, interested in having the state of Texas reimburse us on based on enrollment instead of ADA. And so I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I, I'm not sure how far that's going to go, but it is one of the legislative priorities they're pushing. Uh, the other comment that came up when uh, you were asking questions about PBL and other ways that the uh, blended learning will be delivered. Um, I used to work for the Texas High School Project uh, at uh, UTMB Galveston. And I will tell you that uh, well-designed PBL uh, units include direct instruction. So uh, we just need to um, be uh, cognizant of how uh, long it takes to develop really effective PBL units and that uh, our district has made a tremendously wonderful beginning uh, from my observation of other high schools through the years and other uh, school districts. So uh, We'll get there, and the direct instruction is definitely needed as part of the PBL, and um, we'll have it, I'm sure. Absolutely. Thank you for the feedback. I want to thank you, too, Dr. Jensen. Uh, uh, that was helpful to me as well. Okay. So, Any other questions? 
Go ahead, Ms. Westbrook. Okay, yes, ma'am. So this is just a look at our enrollment from a different view. And so over the last 10 years, looking at our peak enrollment, and so we've seen uh, quite a bit of a decline over the, the last few years, or excuse me, about five years or so ago, but over the last few years, we've pretty well um, stabilized. And, and so we've been projecting close to flat enrollment over the last uh, few years. And so we see that in our peak enrollment. And this is a look at the appraised property values and what's happened with our values over the last decade as well. And so you can see our values have consistently risen over the last decade and, and here in blue for 2021, we have an estimated value of just under 15.5 billion. So the proposed budget that the board will be or will be considering this evening is a total of the three legally required budgets that we're required to adopt. And so we must adopt a budget for the general fund, the debt service fund, and the child nutrition fund. And then all of our other budgets, capital projects, the special revenue, those are all planning budgets, but we're specifically adopting these three. And so the general fund budget is $336,991,456. Debt service is uh, estimated at $59,690,952. And our child nutrition budget is $29,500,000. And so the total proposed operating budget for 2021 is $426,182,408. So this is a look at our general fund revenues by source. And we know that um, our, our state aid is, is now the larger portion of our revenue and it's at 54.6 million. And that's, that portion is going up as our property values continue to go up. We, we see the, the taxes collected locally go down as we compress the tax rate and the percentage that the state picks up goes up. So this year our state portion is 54.6 million or percent and the local portion is 43.6 percent and then federal which is um, our SHAR school health and related services and our JROTC cost is included in that federal amount that's anticipated to be about 1.8 percent of our total revenues. Here is a look at our expenditure budgets. Not sure why I'm missing one of my pieces here, but our largest uh, portion of the budget is always in payroll and we're budgeted at 87.3% for our um, payroll. And this is a look at our general fund budget by function in comparison to the adopted budget in 2019-20 by function as well. So here we get into what are the, the big buckets that are included in this year's budget, the proposed budget, and to Ms. Durant's question earlier, um, the ninth grade centers. So the cost for staffing those ninth grade centers, which were approved as part of our 2016 bond referendum, is estimated at $1.8 million. And the intention is to open our ninth grade centers this fall as, um, and use them as ninth grade centers the ones that are that are open and available um, for students to enter in the fall. So the ninth grade centers are, are included here. And the only thing that I would add about that is, you know, based upon our previous conversation early in the summer when COVID first started, we know there's going to be a delay with Westfield, but um, Spring and Decaney are on schedule um, to be able to move forward. And so the plan with, this, with the uh, planning committees is to go ahead and open them, open them, and they're definitely going to be needed as we look at the social distancing and planning uh, for um, reentering to the schools in the fall. That's great. And I couldn't remember, I know we had talked about uh, using them for social distancing, and I didn't know if that was going to expand just the overall high school programs or if we were truly going to do the ninth grade centers. And so I couldn't remember where we landed on that. And so when we get to the appropriate time, I'm just, I'm worried about staffing and, and you know, all the good teachers are getting picked right now. So <laughs> the fall's coming fast. 
Yeah, yeah, we've been definitely planning for that. And then next week, um, when we go over the um, the scenarios, you're going to see evidence of that in, in a specific call out around the ninth grade centers and what the staffing is going to look like for that. Perfect. Then I'll wait till then. Thank you very much. And of course, this uh, 2021 budget includes the first year of full day pre-K across the district at all elementary campuses. And of course, with our uh, state mandated 22 to one student teacher ratio and with pre-K aides that support our teachers in the classroom and the anticipated cost for the full day program is just over $2 million. And we've, we've had a lot of discussion over the last few meetings about the 2.5% general pay increase and the teacher pay scale was approved at our May board meeting. And so we wanted to, at our earlier June board meeting. And so here, just to reiterate that the 2.5% general pay increase is for all staff and it's 2.5% of the control point. Um, the starting teacher salary will be 56500 and we've seen some other districts that have passed their budgets and we know that this salary, this starting salary is a competitive uh, starting salary. And of course, this also, the, as a part of the TASB pay study that compared the school district to 15 other surrounding districts and created a market value for us to um, compare our pay scale to, there are some equity adjustments that are included throughout this, um, this uh, pay increase as well. And the total cost for this 2.5% general pay increase is 9.1 million. And so the net deficit budget that the board would be looking at approving this evening is just um, $7.1 million. Okay, and then this, this budget would not be complete unless we talk about um, the unknowns. And so COVID-19 has a lot of uncertainty that is, that is still hovering over us as we go into passing this budget. We've had quite a bit of discussion about ADA earlier, and we know that we've got some new guidance that we need to deep dive into to see exactly how that's going to impact the district and what we need to do in order to maximize our funding for um, ADA. Enrollment, of course, we anticipate all of our students coming back, whether they're with us remote or, or in the campus in the building, but that's something that, you know, we'll have to keep a close eye on throughout the year. Anytime we go through periods of economic uncertainty, there, um, there tends to be an uptick in property value protest. And so that's something that we'll, we'll keep a watchful eye on as well. And of course that impacts our property tax collections as well as just our citizens and our um, taxpayers ability to pay and the ability to pay on time. So those are things that will of course have an impact potentially on our revenue in 2020. One. On the expenditure side, we at this point, we've worked very closely with our operations team and we feel as though we have adequate supplies for the cleaning and sanitation costs um, to keep our, our buildings and our facilities safe, but we will, it's yet to be seen exactly what, what we'll need to do um, going forward. One thing I did want to mention is that we are receiving a pretty significant amount of um, PPE, the personal protective equipment from TEA as a part of the funds that they receive from the CARES Act. And so we're receiving masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, and face shields that's all coming to the district within the next two to three weeks. And so um, that will certainly help with some of the, the cost that we would have seen going into the next year. So that'll get us with the supply and, and those masks include both adult size and student size masks. And when she so, says significant, it's, an, it's a very significant amount of masks and supplies. Yes, 318,000 masks. Right. Yes. So the next item that we have is it's not one of, it's not a part of our required um, adopted budgets, but we're required to give the opportunity to discuss the federal budgets that are part of the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so we have four um, budgets that we, we know quite well, Title I, Title II, Title III, and then a fairly new one, which is Title IV. Title I is our, our um, 
federal fund that is used to provide resources to help ensure that our students that come from low income families have a quality in education. Title II is to improve the effectiveness of our teachers, principals, and other school leaders. And those are funds that we've used to, to build up our professional development program in the district and helps fund several positions that's a part of our workforce development team. Title III is for um, to ensure our English learners and immigrant students attain English proficiency and that they're able to perform at a high level in English. And then Title IV is um, the that is for to provide a well rounded education, ensure that our students have a safe and healthy environment and to assist with improved use of technology. And so those are our four um, primary federal budgets that we have as part of ESSA, which if, as I mentioned is Every Student Succeeds Act. And here this evening in our virtual audience, we also have um, Kelly Klein, who is our Assistant Superintendent of Federal and State Programs, available if there's any questions or comments um, related to those to those budgets. And I also wanted to note that we have done our required reach out to our private nonprofits in the district to make sure that they're aware of the funds that are available to provide services and resources to them as well. So to ask Ms. Klein, what, have we done any kind of um, audit or assessment to ensure that our fundings are being allocated appropriately to the right areas? And, and have we seen any um, opportunities for changes? And so one thing that we did this this year is um, we do have some additional funds that are available because we did see increases in each one of those funds. And so we are changing the allocation to increase the amount that's being allocated to our campuses. So as far as audits go, we we do have our as part of our annual audit with Whitley Penn when they come out and audit us they always select one of the programs and title one is in heavy rotation because of the amount that we receive for title one so we do receive that audit on a regular basis and there's always a continuous review of compliance as well as the use of the funds and and going through and making sure that the dollars are being maximized as best as best as possible I've seen this serious trouble. I just want to make sure we're staying on top of it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, Dr. Jensen. Okay, Ms. Westbrooks, uh, I was interested in Title II being used for professional development. Have we um, uh, moved the professional development into the blended learning uh, format as well as the uh, instruction for students? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, Ms. Bradford, I um, spoke on that a, a few weeks ago. Um, we actually were forced to do that with um, COVID-19. And so we began doing that during that uh, particular process. If you remember, we also um, received a grant uh, this past year from TEA uh, to implement. Um, I think one of the things you had asked for, Dr. Jensen, is as we're looking at programs, instead of just rolling them out to everyone, why don't we try piloting some of them to see how well we get. And so we piloted uh, blended learning and we ended up with having a, a small blended learning conference where other districts came in to see um, our work. We actually toured three of our campuses and um, we received glowing reviews on that pilot. And so um, COVID-19 forced us to go straight into blended learning and we already had a, a roadmap to do that because we had already done that for a year. So you all's recommendations were great for that. And so now we're going to be um, going into more blended learning uh, for the fall and we're piloting another part of blended learning for summer school now. Ms. Durant, we do have a very robust federal and state compliance team that works hand in hand with the campuses on a regular basis to ensure that they're maximizing their funds. And we try to put as many dollars available to the campuses as possible, um, utilizing those funds to provide some supplemental resources and supplemental staffing as well. Thank you. I wanted to give uh, Ms. Kelly Klein an opportunity to speak as well. So, but you answer oh. me. No, yes. I, she is she is on the panel and Miss Klein, do you have anything you'd like to add? Mr. Mr. Adams wanted to know who you were. So this gives you an opportunity to, for everyone to meet you virtually. Promoting her to panelists now, here she comes.
Once you meet her, you'll never forget her. Yeah. There she is. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, to listen to uh, Ms. Westbrooks talk about the programs that I supervise. Um, Title I, I've been involved with that. With Lapita, when I first came to spring, I've been involved with it since coming first to Texas back in 1997. We are very heavily in compliance with these programs. When you hear the word title, these are entitlements by the federal government, and we just have to show that we're good stewards of the money. This year, when we saw some increases, we wanted to make sure, I spoke with Anne about this, that we wanted to give a higher per pupil allocation to our, our students. And so we went from 250 to $300 per pupil um, for our, that have a 75% or higher economically disadvantaged rate. So I had to do what's called a rank and serve. So we make sure that those campuses that have over 75% ED get $300 per pupil, and those under 75% get 250. So that was a, a tremendous increase, which the schools uh, really liked. And as far as Title II, that's our workforce development, and that's our PD. We saw an increase with those funds. Title III is, we call it LEP, and we go back from LEP to calling it, um, I guess, our, our language acquisition program. And we also received immigrant money this year also. And that goes back and forth depending on how many immigrant children that we're able to um, identify. And Title IV, I know that Joe Clark is out there and Dr. Zimmerman is out there. Um, they're doing a fabulous program um, with Title IV. But we do have a very robust team that makes sure that we're on top of every dollar that's spent, right? We wanna make sure that every dollar gets into the hands of the principals and that gets into the hands of the students and the teachers. And that's all reflected in the campus improvement plan, which goes to the board in September. Thank so, you. Under yeah, the direction of Ann Westbrooks, we are financially secure and in compliance with all the measures of the title programs. Thank you. Okay. I'm not quite sure I get at this. Do I stay on, Jeremy, or do you? I'm, I'm going to transfer you back over there. Thank you. Figuring out Thank how to you. do that now. Okay, so a name to a face or a face to a name for everyone. <laughs> and that is actually the last thing that I had and just I, for some reason this one's just kind of been on my mind. So I wanted to end with a, a little bit of a, a quote here that difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. And one thing that we've we've been challenged quite a bit throughout this entire budget process throughout this entire uh, spring semester and just changes every way you turn but the team that we've been able to work with and as we're building the scenarios and preparing for next year we've seen the silver lining and that's the reimagining of how we we instruct our students and how we educate our students and so even though it's a lot of uncertainty ahead of us we're, we feel as though we've got a great team we've done a lot of good work and and we're we're meeting the challenge every time it comes at us so that's our 2021 proposed budget thank you miss westbrooks do we have any other questions from the board Hearing none, I'm going to ask Mr. Brinkley, do we have anyone registered to uh, speak on our uh, public uh, public hearing for the board? No, the Madam budget? President, we do not. Um, and just for the record, uh, we did include a Google form on the uh, same page as the link so that any members of the public who wish to uh, speak tonight regarding this public hearing item or any other public hearing item tonight would be able to do so and, and no one registered for this item. Okay, thank you. Thank you for making that special effort to reach out to our community. We do want them to have an opportunity to come forth and ask us questions uh, and let us know their concerns. So oh, thank you. As there are no identified speakers, we will continue with tonight's agenda. I will now entertain a motion to adopt the 2020-2021 Spring Independent School District budget as presented by the administration.
Uh, Madam President, I move that the board of trustees adopt the 2020-2021 Spring Independent School District budget as presented by the administration. Do I have a second? I second it. It's been moved by Winfred Adams, second by Justine Durant, that the Board of Trustees adopt the 2020-2021 Spring Independent School District budget as presented by the administration. Questions? Okay, so I will now poll the board members for their vote to approve this 2020-2021 Spring Independent School District budget as presented. Winfred Adams, Jr. Aye. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Don Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, vote aye. Uh, motion carries unanimously. So thank you everyone and thank you, Miss Westbrook. Thank you. Our next Congratulations, Miss Westbrook. I know that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is, but as you yes. heard from, from Miss Klein, you know that we, we have a, a big team that's working on it and doing great things working together on it. So thank you so much. And thanks to the rest of the budget team that I know is in the audience, Alicia Kennedy, Melaine Garganis, those ladies, they work so hard every year. So it, it's a team effort. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you to your entire team. Thank you. We appreciate your work. Our next item is the public hearing for the 2020-2021 optional flexible school day program. So at this time, I will recognize our executive chief of district operations, Mark Miranda. Yes, hi, President Newhouse, uh, wow. members of the board, uh, Dr. Watson. This is on page 10 of your regular agenda item. This is the optional flexible school day program for the Achieving Success Alternative Program. We call that the ASAP program. I'm actually gonna turn the baton over to Dr. Hinojosa to give us a little bit more detail um, on the specifics of this item. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Um, Ms. Newhouse and members of the board, you know um, our ASAP program and as you can see, we are actually, we've been implementing this program for five years and we will be moving into our sixth year. This program is specifically designed for children or young people that are at risk of dropping out of school. And so those indicators are the indicators that qualify the students. For the past five years, we've been focusing on our high school students, specifically students at 11th and 12th grade that have hardships or extenuating circumstances. They may be 18 year olds with um, six, 12 credits, 18 credits, and they don't see a way out to graduate. They may be students that are overaged and are having to work to help their families. And so coming to school from 7.15 to 2.30, it's just not possible as they're holding down a full-time job. We also have students that are already teen parents. And so this program specifically is designed to assist those students. Um, as you'll recall, we have um, an altered school day schedule. It's been a four hour schedule for the past four years. This past year, we actually implemented and added a, a tacked on an hour to that day. So the students come either in the morning session, the 7.15 um, um, session to 12.30, or they come in the evening, um, the PM session, the 3 to 8.30 session. And that extra hour that we tacked in was and is specifically designed to help these students get prepared for their end of course. Um, what we notice is that many of the students that are at danger, in danger of dropping out is due to the fact that they've had a difficult time passing their EOCs. 
And so this past year, under this program, we served 136 students. Out of those 136 students, 53 graduated this past, what is it now, two weeks ago? So 53 students um, were able to graduate. And this is giving them that flexibility. Um, they come to school for four hours. And this past year, we made it five hours a day, which still gives us gives them the opportunity to fulfill the other responsibilities that they may have. And as a district, we actually receive um, full funding for these students. One thing that I do want to point out this year that's a little different is you'll see, and you heard me say that it was specifically targeted for our high school students that are at risk of dropping out. When we read the law and the policy really clearly, there's a component which I'd like for you to um, look in page 10, letter B, and it also talks about attendance and students that are either being denied uh, credit or may be retained due to attendance. And so this year, what we've done is we are expanding the waiver to include students in the elementary, middle, and high school. And so we're asking for the waiver as an open-ended waiver for all of the grade levels. Um, if we run, and in our conversation with TEA, had a really in-depth conversation as to how we could use this waiver to serve um, students at all grade levels. And so many times we have elementary students or middle school students that are also being challenged in coming to school for the entire period of time, either due to their parents' hardship or any other circumstance. And so this waiver this year will be much broader so that we can take the opportunity and if we identify students in elementary or middle school that are having challenges with attendance, we can also pull them into the ASAP program and allow them to come for four hours a day, um, receive all the instruction that is needed in a blended setting, uh, very much um, like what you saw this spring semester, face-to-face -face and online and for them to be able to either recover uh, credits, recover the grade level and or catch up with their um, counterparts. So we're very excited to have the opportunity and flexibility to increase the number of schools that we are requesting this waiver for. Dr. A lot, do you, do you have any questions? Yes. Dr. Hinoza, I do have a question. Uh, how is the um, technology and blended wor uh, learning working for these ASAP students? Actually, it's, it's working very well. And what you see with them, and, and we replicated a lot of the learnings that were happening at ASAP slash our virtual program, and we actually um, were able to, um, oh my goodness, what's the, the word, expanded to our replicated in our remote learning. Um, the ASAP virtual program started using Schoology first. So they were up and running with Schoology back in October. And so the students had the opportunity, this particular group of students had the opportunity to get in there along with the teachers and use that. The other piece, and you heard the superintendent talk about our grant where we um, implemented that blended learning. So ASAP um, virtual students did the same thing, is to have time with the teacher, to have some direct instruction, and then having the students go out and either while they're still in school working online, um, while the teacher's there to provide some assistance, or when they go home or they work, go to their work, they can still um, continue their learning. So it's actually given us the opportunity to, you know, practice our blended learning and scale it up um, and replicate in what we did this past uh, spring semester district-wide. And I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Uh, when we did the graduation walks, it was astounding to me, the students I met. These were not kids who uh, were uh, deadbeats. They were heroes. 
They are working multiple jobs to support their families. They're taking care of younger children. Uh, they are just, they deserve every bit of support and help we can give them. So thank you for having this program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Hinojosa, I want to echo what uh, Dr. Jensen just said. I also want to add that I would really appreciate seeing the data on these expanded programs, particularly as a baseline, as a program that we're starting anew so that we can see what the growth looks like over the years. Um, so I will be wanting to see the data we used uh, to determine that opening up this program to the, the, the younger kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, and we don't know if we'll have those students that qualify, but we want to be able to request it, open it up, and then track the students um, and see how they do and how they respond. As Dr. Jensen was saying, you know, we have noticed in these past five years that our high school students are extremely responsive. It has been, you know, a, a lifesaver for them because they're able to graduate and have that diploma. Now we'll have the opportunity to see, number one, do we have students in the elementary and middle school that qualify, that the parents need this support, and then um, start tracking them to determine how they do. Will they be as successful as our older students are? And Mr. Adams, I want to be clear. I want to be clear as well. Um, so when we're talking about the elementary and middle school students, we definitely will provide you that data. But one of the reasons we're wanting to bring this is we talk a lot at TASB and we talk a lot through even my professional organizations about local control. We're applying for this waiver should we need to use it in an uncertain environment, much like we did in 2017, not knowing that all the waivers that you all approved um, and that we send in our district of innovation, we're using now that other districts don't have. And so I do want to be clear, we're not rushing out right now to go start a new program, but we are combing through all of the TEA documents and waivers to find out what would benefit our kids, because a lot of these waivers have deadlines to apply for it. And so we want to apply for these, should we need them, you all can be as flexible and nimble as possible to respond to our needs in our community. Uh, Dr. Watson, your, your comment speaks directly to the question I was going to pose in that in the uncertain times and the changing world in which we live, we know education is going to look different, not just education, but people's places of employment are changing and where they are and how flexible they are to be able to support their kids. And to bring this in now at an elementary and a middle school level could really put parents in a position where they can still do their jobs and then be available during that flexible time to give their kids the attention that they need because we just don't really know where things are headed and I want to commend you all for the foresight to actually include them because this could really really make a big difference in helping us already be ahead of the curve to address some of the gaps and challenges that we may be, see behind this uh, global crisis. And so uh, uh, this is actually really fantastic. It's a really good point, Justine. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. As I will echo uh, Ms. Durant and continue to add to that, that reaching out to the elementary and middle school students, I think it is just a wonderful move because we know that there are some students that are behind because of COVID-19 right now. And we're going to encounter some more in the future. Statistics says a highest dropout rate is at middle school for boys, specifically black boys uh, in particular is at the eighth grade level. And so to be able to give them something to look forward to, to be able to catch up before I even get to high school, I would hope would encourage them to want to continue in school and not drop out. So to have these services for those students who we know will have some problems, is I'm just so happy that we're able to do that for them. Thank you. Okay, so when do we vote? <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hannah Hosa and Mr. Miranda. 
Mr. Brinkley, do we have anyone registered to speak on this agenda item under public hearing? Uh, no, Madam President, we do not. Okay. Since there are no identified speakers, let us continue uh, with the night's agenda. And that means that I will entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees adopt the 2020-2021 optional flexible school day program <clears throat> as presented by the administration. President Newhouse, I move that the Board of Trustees adopt the 20 21 optional flexible school day program as presented by administration. There's second. Second. It's been moved by Justine Durant, second by Don Davis, that the Board of Trustees adopt the 2020 2021 optional flexible school day program as presented by the administration. Hearing no other discussion, I will now poll the board members for their vote to approve the 2021-2020-2021 optional flexible school day program as presented by the administration. Uh, Winfred Adams, Jr. Aye. Kelly Hodges. You have to unmute yourself, Ms. Hodges. I uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Because I'm on my you. phone. Thank you. Okay. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Okay. Aye. Don Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, vote aye. So the motion carries unanimously. Thank you, thank you. We're so excited about that. So, uh, President Newhouse, I think that this is also a great opportunity, uh, Chief Dunn Ophield, for marketing and promoting and communicating uh, these, this great opportunity to the community. So, I'm going to look forward to some of your fantastic articles. <laughs> Yes, we do let, need to let the community know that we have this option, that it's available for our students. I'd like to again recognize the Executive Chief of District Operations Officer, Mark Miranda. Yeah, President Newhouse, we're gonna be on page 25 for our next item. This is the Texas Virtual Schools Network course waiver. So for the past, um, 10 years, Spring ISD has been a provider of courses for the Texas Virtual Schools Network. This is a program that's administered by uh, the, tech, the TEA. Um, they set the standards and approve the courses and the professional development online for teachers. And as a provider, um, districts must submit a waiver for the Texas Virtual Schools Network course review process that's administered by TEA and certify that our courses meet the Texas Virtual Schools Network standards and requirements. So this past year, the high school TEKS were changed for ELA, and that's prompting us to have to go for the waiver for um, the, uh, the next set of standards for um, this virtual network. And I will be happy to entertain any questions or comments and comments. yeah that confused me a little bit so okay. does that mean when, when we got the waiver it repeated year over year and now that we've had some changes we have to apply again so we're yeah so we're only required to do the waiver when there's a when there's a material change and because okay. the peaks were changed for okay. high, so we actually haven't done this waiver in quite a while i know okay that's why you probably don't remember it coming up uh, and Mr. Miranda, I was a little concerned that uh, Algebra 1, Algebra 2 were listed as new courses. So uh, is that because they have new requirements or uh, why, is, why are they listed as new course offerings in the waiver? For that question, I'm going to turn to Dr. Anahosa. That's a, a good question, uh, Dr. Jensen. And as you know, this is our virtual program that we have. 
and we have listed Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and there's a couple other courses listed there um, because we have, um, we're calling it new course uh, offerings. We've um, revised those courses and um, not new teaks. The Algebra teaks haven't changed in quite a while, but we have revised and are now offering these specific courses. Um, you'll also see there's one listed in Earth Science um, we have many of our teachers that not only are the teachers, but they're also developing the courses. We are a district provider of these courses, and we actually have students from out of district that sign up. Districts sign up to take our own courses, and they will get credit at their um, uh, high school, specifically our AP courses. Thank you. That's a great marketing opportunity. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. We, we, we are a provider. We're very proud of the work that we do, it, it, that our teachers, um, Dr. Janine Wilson is the administrator over both the ASAP program and the virtual program. Uh, very uh, proud of the virtual program that we've had for over 10 years, and we continue to evolve. We continue to expand the courses that we offer. Um, so not only do our own students um, have the opportunity to take it, but also um, students from across the state. I remember when we had a student that came and spoke with us who was an Olympian swimmer, and she said she would not have been able to participate in the Olympics had she not been able to take her courses virtually. So um, mm -hmm. it's a very positive and great opportunity all the way around. It is, absolutely. It, it frees up the students, and especially a lot of our athletes, a lot of our um, students in advanced courses. Um, oftentimes, we're not able to offer those courses in our comprehensive high schools because the numbers do not make. We may not have as many students um, for an um, AP calculus course, but you can take it online. Or if your schedule is not falling just right and you need that additional math course, you can take it with the um, virtual uh, program. And the great thing about it, it is that it's both synchronous and asynchronous. So a lot of the work that we're moving into right now um, due to COVID and due to the new environment, um, Dr. Wilson and her team have been doing this for quite a while. And so our students, because we do have teachers at the virtual program, um, are able to interact with the students, of course, remotely, but they also make school visits. So they also go check in um, with our students to see how they're doing at their home campus. A lot of our students take anywhere from one and sometimes up to three courses online. Well, I'm glad to see we're adding additional offerings, especially the algebra, because I really, with the change in times, I can only see this school, high school growing. Absolutely. And, you know, just, just to brag a little bit more, we're just one of nine providers in the entire state. We're one of nine providers of the courses. And so this past year, we had 21 students, as I said, enrolled from out of our district, and they do pay tuition um, for mm -hmm. the courses that they take with us. So that's a little, you know, income. The revenue stream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a great opportunity um, to promote Spring ISD. Spring ISD. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I will now entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees approve the waiver request for the Texas Virtual School Network course review process as presented by the administration. Madam President, I move that the Board of Trustees approve the waiver request for the Texas Virtual School Network course review process as presented by the administration. Second. It's been moved by Deborah Jensen, second by Winfred Adams Jr. that the Board of Trustees approve the waiver request for the Texas Virtual School Network course review process as presented by the administration. If there's no other discussion, 
I will now poll the board, poll the board members for their vote to approve the waiver request for the Texas Virtual School Network co course review process as presented by the administration. Winfred Adams, Jr. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Aye. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Don Davis. Captain Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, aye. The motion carries unanimously. So again, thank you, Mr. Miranda. Please continue. Sure, for the next item, I'll be on page 30. And for this item, I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully, if you bear with me for just a second, let me get that up. See if I can get that going. Um, let's see here. Okay, where, 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 where? where? Oh, hold on a second. Bear with me, please. Oh, here it comes. Hmm. Let me see here. Let me know if you are actually seeing my PowerPoint. We can see it. Yes. Okay, great, great, great. All right. So, um, so this is the uh, Westfield High School JROTC Center. And I want to just uh, give you an overview on this. So last fall, the Board of Trustees approved a one-time expenditure of $1 million in non-bond related capital project funds to utilize existing facilities at Westfield High School for the creation of a Westfield High School JROTC Center. This, this million dollar budget allocation was actually noted earlier in the third budget review on page 12 and 13 on the document shared earlier tonight by Mr. Westbrook, so it was a part of that as well. And while, of course, the JROTC staff at Westfield would have liked a standalone building, we are happy to report that with the funds allocated by the board and using existing facility infrastructure, we're able to provide Westfield High School with a JROTC center that compares really favorably um, to the uh, facility at Spring High School. So let me see if, did that move? <laughs> I'm not sure if it did or not. No, it didn't move. Okay, well, let me try again. How's that? Yes. Okay, so talking a little bit about the existing um, program at Westfield High School, there's about 350 to 400 students in that program. Um, it's a designated JROTC um, in areas that are actually varied uh, and not a real cohesive space. So we're trying to correct that in this process. Um, for example, non-JROTC students um, have the ability to circulate through the JROTC space. So it's not a, a kind of a synchronous um, location for them to be in. The current program is actually using three portable buildings um, in the parking lot behind Westfield. I think you've seen those. Um, there's inadequate office space, the rifle range um, is inside the main building. You'll see that here in just a second. The range isn't standard shooting range length at this uh, present time. So that's something we also wanna be able to address. And there are no exterior doors um, and storage space are inadequate. So there are some, th some of the things that we were charged with trying to correct. Um, and so um, in the next slide, what you see here is just kind of a rendering if you can imagine Westfield High School from a, from a rendering standpoint, the uh, yellow space that you see there uh, contains the shooting range that the ROTC use, uses. The current location of the shooting range was actually determined to be the best location for the JROTC Center. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about um, what it looks like now and I'm, we're gonna get to um, where we're heading. So first of all, I've already mentioned that there's a lack of storage that's requiring um, the ROTC to utilize the T buildings located away from the range. They're not in vicinity of the range. 
circulation through the space is, is not cohesive. Other students have access to the area. And so it just really is, is missing some, some things that are gonna make it a lot better. So here's what we're planning to do to the center. And we've actually already begun some of this work. So the demolition of the existing spaces, if you kind of notice on the uh, PowerPoint, the existing ROTC um, area for the shooting range and the classrooms um, is on this rendering. And when you see all the red dotted lines on this, those are going to be part of the expansion of the JROTC program. So that's gonna allow for the, the program to expand, for the range to be expanded to meet the standards for a shooting range in that area. And then also allows for the modification uh, of circulation through that space. And so as we kind of take a look at it, um, what's really a, a great thing is that the existing facility can accommodate this. Um, there's nothing comparable to this, for example, at Spring High School and their existing facility. And so we're really benefiting from the fact that Westfield has an open area that we're going to be able to utilize for the shooting range. And so we're really excited about that part. Um, if you look at the new JROTC Center, what we're going to be able to do is provide a total reno renovated space of over 10,000 square feet. We're actually renovating in the, in the area surrounding the JROTC about 14,000 total square feet, with 10 being in that primary JROTC area. It's going to include four classrooms that are expandable to two larger rooms of 1,500 square feet. So when they need to have larger gatherings, they can do that. So it'll have um, expandable walls. Um, we'll have a regulation indoor rifle range, which is about 4,000 square feet. We'll be providing a locker room for staff, a, additional office space for staff, an armory that's going to house um, gun cabinets for their air rifles and for their drill rifles. We'll be able to be in the armory. A, a, a large uniform storage um, that they'll be able to utilize inside the building. And of course, student lockers with restrooms that are all contained within the JROTC Center. So this is the design that we're looking at for the center that, that we are um, currently beginning to, to build right now. So all of the JROTC facilities are now going to be located together. So that's a, a huge benefit from that. There's going to be circulation uh, around the center that's going to be just a completely um, enclosed kind of cohesive space um, for the JROTC. And the rifle range is now going to be regulation size and it can be used for drills as well. It's going to have that open ceiling you saw from the other pictures um, that we had um, previously. And so uh, the entire space, again, is very comparable to what you see at the other school um, and very much contained as, a, as its own center and its own space. And so lastly here, just to give you an idea on the timeline, um, we began right after the board um, gave us the funds, the million dollars for this. We began meeting with Westfield High School and the staff over at Westfield um, in December. We had meetings in December, January, February, and March. We were at 50% design review. Um, and then in May, we did the complete design review. And construction, the GMP-1, was actually approved by the board in May of 2020. And we've begun demo work um, in this month in July. You saw that from some of the other photos um, that we were able to provide here earlier. The framing in the drywall will begin in July. So we'll start doing that. The new ceilings will begin to drop in in July as well. And we actually plan to be substantially complete um, in August. So probably about mid-August was when we will be substantially complete um, for this. And so um, that concludes uh, just the brief update on what we're doing over at Westfield High School, and I'd be happy to um, entertain any questions. This is Trustee Davis. I got a whole lot of questions. Can you hear me? I can. I got quite a few questions. Uh, first of all, I wish that uh, I would have been included when you guys started, uh, y'all started paying down stuff, because uh, I'm not really sure the 123 room that you're talking about using for a rifle range, knowing that I was a person who started the program and I know the regulation like the back of my hand, I'm not fully sure that raising that silly in that room, which I think is totally impossible, is going to meet the requirements to keep the debt safe. 
All it's going to take is just one air rifle bullet to come back and hit somebody's eye and injure them. We got the answer to that. 123, the one you're talking about, 123 is not capable. We're not be, there's no way you can raise a ceiling when you got a floor right above you. So I wish I had been included in that conversation, but I was not. So um, my concern is this. You know, we built a standalone building for for Spring High School, which is which is good. They they're one of the top in the nations and so forth. The Caney High School came with a brand new program, brand new school, because that was part of the new school and foundation from the beginning. Winfield's the oldest program in the district. It's twenty years old. Matter of fact, it's twenty years old this week. Okay, it's twenty years old. It laid the foundations for the other two schools to come along years later. So it's kind of ironic that we still get a renovated, thrown together building that we're just going to throw together for that program. But there's a program that laid the foundation for all the other programs in the district. Um, they have a long history. They, they, they have won three national championships and a national debate team. They won state, regional, and national levels. We have three cadets that came through the program. They're no longer with us. They gave their life you know, for our country and our freedom. We have cadets that have completed West Point, the Air Force Academy, and Navy Academy. I cannot understand, maybe I missed it somewhere early on, I can understand why they cannot get a standalone building just to wear a spring. We always talk about being fair and being and, and doing right for all our children across our district. We look like the South Side again and not get the fair deal. That's, those are my comments. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Davis, uh, thank you definitely for your comments. Um, as you can remember, back in um, November when this was passed, there was no funds that were allocated um, to do any additional work. And so um, we definitely heard your comments and feedback and placed it as one of the items that we felt necessary to go ahead and upgrade as well. Um, the spring program is part of the bond. And so um, I definitely appreciate your feedback and we'll continue to get more feedback from you and the staff that are there. But in order to do more work, we would need to go to our community and ask for another bond to do that um, because there's no allocated funding source uh, right now for us to, um, to do a standalone building um, like the one that, that, that they have over at Spring. And so to that point, um, they've looked at um, the Decaney building who doesn't have a standalone facility as well. And they are working with the team to meet all of the specifications and guidelines according to the code. But definitely we appreciate the feedback and we'll continue to look at that to ensure that the standards are met um, based upon the work that we're doing with the funds that, that the board allocated for us to use to do this work. Dr. Watson, those are my comments. Uh, I just want to go on record with my comments. There's nothing I can do now. To my understanding, the renovations are already started. So those are my comments. I just want to be on record of my concerns and my comments. Thank you. Mr. Miranda, uh, I had a question. Uh, are the square, is the square footage of the different ROTC facilities comparable? Yes, ma'am. The square footage at Westfield um, is around, you saw on the screen, about mm -hmm. 10,000 square feet. Uh, the spring um, is, is around 12, so uh, they're, they're similar. Mm -hmm. the, the space is actually pretty much the same in terms of the classrooms, the shooting range, the armory, the ROTC office, um, locker rooms, and the restrooms all being contained in there. Okay, and uh, also about the shooting range, uh, is uh, what do you have to do to make that ceiling safe? Um, we're not putting a drop ceiling in, so it's a, a 10 foot tall ceiling. Um, we, I, to my knowledge, we didn't get um, a lot of pushback from the team on that, but um, we can certainly go back and check, but it'll be about a 10 foot ceiling um, in that area. Okay. Uh, I, Just keep, keep uh, going on. So the, the, they use the pre-charged pneumatic air rifles um, in mm -hmm. there. The guns are a little bit different than just so everybody knows if you're if you weren't familiar with the what they use in the rifle ranges. I'm not familiar. Uh, and the other thing is, um, uh, for a number of years, we've seen you take old office buildings and make schools and police departments. Uh, we've seen you change a YMCA building into a wonderful uh, community meeting building. Uh, I, I've never seen you do anything 
that was uh, poor quality. I mean, uh, I just, um, you know, have every uh, confidence that you're going to do a good job here. Yeah, that's our goal. I mean, our, our goal is definitely to provide the, the absolute best facility that we're capable of doing on this project. For sure. Hey, Mark, it's Chester Davis again. I'm trying to look, I'm trying to look at your draft is. Where's the, uh, you mentioned about, where well, I'm using I'm using terminology that's probably used. They need, a, they need an indoor drill field. Have you mentioned about anything that you can be able to convert the classrooms? You may have mentioned about it in here. So if they may have drill inside, in climate weather, will they be able to do that? They'll be able to do the drills inside the shooting range. Well, what, 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 what's, what's, what slide is there, Mark? Um, slide eight. Um, okay. okay. My, my slide, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 okay, I see it. Thank you. Because they had to be able to march inside. You know, when, when we first established the program, we had two waivers. One of the waivers was that we, that we did not have affected mothership range and we did not have an indoor range. And that way, still. I mean, I think Dr. Watson said, "How can a unit get a uh, unit extension every year?" Where well, they had a waiver from the very beginning, so we never had an outdoor range and never indoor uh, drill area. But now we're, we're having those indoor range, indoor range, and indoor drill area. Next year, when they had the accreditation, that waiver would not be required. So, thank you on that note. Thank you. You're welcome. I did want to speak up on the on this particular topic uh, because I think as a board we've always strived to be equitable to across the board to all of our campuses and all of our students. I know in our previous bond, not the most recent one, um, we focused um, you know a freestanding actually weight room and um, athletic center at Westfield. This time we looked at the largest ROTC program in the state of Texas and tried to make some accommodations for spring high. And so we, we, we've done uh, our best to, to be equitable, but I don't want um, to lightly dismiss Trustee Davis's comments because he's correct in a lot of what he's saying. It is the original, it's the first program. And I think we need to continue to put focus on making sure that we bring their facilities up to the same quality that the other ones have. And I think as a longstanding board member, I want to um, just acknowledge uh, that we could have done better and we could have done better sooner. But I appreciate that we're moving forward to do the best that we can and that we all care. It's a priority for all of us. And we're going to continue to make sure that our program at Westfield continues to grow and receives the same support of all of our programs. And so Trustee Davis, I will join you in making that a, pro, uh, a priority and um, making sure that whenever we're allocating or find additional funds, that we do what we can to meet that obligation. Thank you. And I want to do a disclosure real quick. I need to do this. Uh, now I'll finish, finish my comments. My disclosure is that everyone know that I'm that I was the first instructor in the uh, in the district. I, mean, I brought ROTC to uh, Spring ISD. So my comments tonight was not based on being the first instructor. My comments not based on that hallway full of trophies I held at Westfield High School. It was on base. It was only based on the fact that I want to make sure that Cadets Westfield High School had the same type of facility and the same opportunity to grow. After all, after all, all TC program. That's my disclosure. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Davis, and thank you, Mr. Rant uh, and uh, Dr. Jensen. Yes, we do want to be equitable with all of our schools and uh, the program. So we will continue to review and look at this situation here and follow it. Uh, and see how it goes and work with Mr. Miranda on making sure that we are equitable, equitable in all of our schools. So thank you. Thank you. For our next item, I'd like to recognize our Chief of Human Resources and Human Capital Accountability, Dr. Julie Hill. Good evening, Madam President, trustees and Dr. Watson um, and all of our um, cabinet chiefs assembled, if we could go to page 31, 
we are now going to look at the 2020-2021 uh, staffing guidelines. Our staffing guidelines are brought forward in accordance with board policy DP local and DC regulation. And um, each year we ask our uh, board of trustees to approve the staffing guidelines. Um, just in general, the staffing guidelines actually show the staffing um, that we use at each of our schools as well as the support um, staff from all of the divisions and departments that support the school. So that's the detail of what you see. Um, in the staffing guidelines. I'd like to call your attention to three items in particular. Um, there are two documents that um, you probably have in front of you that are easier to look at. Uh, one is a, a staffing guidelines changes that really let you know what all the changes are from the 2019-20 to the 2020-2021 um, document. And then you also um, have an electronic version of the staffing, the staffing guidelines for this year. I want to call your attention to um, one change that impacts all of the schools, and that is the very first um, role that's listed on your staffing guideline changes, and that's um, for our English as a second language, our ESL calculation is being reduced from $1,200 to $1,100. That's just based on, um, on, on, a, on a change in funding, um, but of course that has an impact at every single school, all of our schools that have English um, language learners at it. I also wanted to call your attention to um, pages seven and eight that are um, about halfway down the pages. Um, that actually has to do with changes that we've had as a result of our first year operating um, our Spring Leadership Academy and Springwoods Village Middle School. Those are um, after the first year, there were some funding adjustments and some um, positioning adjustments that we had to make. And so you'll find um, those changes on those particular pages. It looks like it's a lot, it's really not. It's just a little bit of tweaking that we've had to do to make sure that we are adequately meeting the needs of the students and the staff there at the campus. And then I'd like to call your attention to the last row. Pages 15 and 16 identify the changes um, on the SPED staffing guidelines uh, based on, on new law. There are a lot of title changes that took place and um, actually allocations in terms of class sizes. And so that's where the, the biggest changes took place in terms of numbers and titles. Um, and so you'll see that from your guide last year to this one, there are significant changes. At the very bottom in the small print for those that need it, there's actually a legend that tells you what the abbreviations are that we use in the column that says guideline impacted. Are there any questions? Thank you, Madam President. Okay. Hearing no questions, I will I now. Have, I do have a comment. Ahead. At oh, the please. small font at the bottom of the page, SLA, uh, you have it as uh, it's Spring Leadership Academy, isn't it? Oh, it should be, be Spring Leadership Academy. I apologize for that. Okay. That's a minor thing. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020-2021 staffing guidelines as presented by the administration. Are you looking for a motion, Madam President? Yes. Okay. I I will, I, I will give you a motion. I move that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020-2021 staffing guidelines as presented by the administration. Mr. Trustee Davis, I'll second that motion. It has been moved by Deborah Jensen and second by Don Davis that the Board of Trustees approve the 2020-2021 staffing guidelines as presented by the administration. Is there any other discussion? Hearing the, 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 the amendment to this document that Dr. Jensen was talking about, I just want to make sure that we are going to do that. The change to Spring Leadership Academy. Um, th that's on the just the document that identifies the the changes and so I'll be happy to make that that change the 
the name is everything's correct inside the staffing guidelines themselves. Okay. That's the support change document, but we'll be happy to change it. No yeah, that's a that's a really good catch, Dr. Jensen. I, so I just want to make sure we do fix that. Absolutely. Well, you do know my grandson attends that school. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will now poll um, board members. Uh, um, President Newhouse. Yes. As it relates to the allocations, as it relates to the allocations for SPED, when will we discuss that? I'm curious to know what, what allocation we're talking about and what changes are we talking about? When, when will we dive into that? Anybody can Actually, we can um, dive in now. Um, I, I would happily defer to um, Chief Hinojosa, who um, did some of these final changes, actually helped to um, make sure the document was correct based on um, the changes in special education, and she worked most recently with them. Um, is there anything on page 15 and 16 or where those changes are? Would you like her just mm -hmm. to quick walk through? Is that what you wanted to actually know what the changes were? Ms. Hodges? Uh, hold on, let me go to page, um, I guess the, I was concerned about were the, um, um, if, what, what's being reallocated, is there a reduction? I know from, um, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm six months, a month into the board, but from my understanding, um, there's a cost per child. Is that what we're talking about when we say allocation? Can you, maybe if you can define allocation in this term for me, what, what we're talking about. Absolutely. I'll let Dr. Hinojosa start because she's ready and then I'll jump back in. Thank you, Chief. Okay. And Ms. Hodges, I'm pulling up the document so I can see both of them at the same time, but you will see mm -hmm. your, um, changes and examples you'll see related to the um, the position called special education resource. One of the things that we had, we determined after almost spending the entire year evaluating the performance of our students, um, we determined that many of our students that are in the inclusion program that are in general ed, having teachers come mm -hmm. and support them. Um, we call those inclusion teachers. So mm -hmm. teachers and sometimes paraprofessionals, the students are actually not receiving the direct instruction uh, that they need in order to close those gaps, whatever um, they may be encountering. And so what we've done is we've slightly increased that um, number of students per teacher um, and or teacher aid, and instead created positions where the students can be pulled out in a small group instruction specifically in reading and math where the teacher will be working the certified teacher either in reading and math or math and special education will be working directly with the students um, based on their needs whether it's reading or math and have the opportunity to be away from the large group and get that intense direct instruction and we've been able to determine that um, based on the students' performance and the teachers, they're not able to provide that support when the students are in that classroom with a 30 plus students. So this will allow us the opportunity to provide that direct instruction and direct support based on the student needs. And that's where you'll see the changes in the allocation. All of the others are more, as Chief Hill said, uh, changes in names, so you'll see the changes in formerly known as our PPCD program or our early childhood program. We've aligned those names there. Okay, thank you. So I will say one of the things okay. I've always struggled with this um, this process is not understanding the data or the content behind the changes. So for for example, um, as I look at it, uh, we're going to uh, pre-K-8 and bilingual pre-K-8 allocations change from a half to one. 
to accommodate the full day pre-K. So that that's pretty clear, but all of them don't always, they aren't always clear to me. So English as a second language calculation was reduced from 1200 to 1100. Why? So, so it would be helpful if we maybe had a little more content behind it. Yes, ma'am. With the English as a second language allocation, that's an allocation that we've been trying to right size over the last few years. And it's a balance between the funding that we're actually receiving for that program and the needs of the program. And so initially, I believe we started off, it was uh, 1,400 and well, go back even further, we were giving a 0.5 FTE allocation for every 28 students. And that 0.5 was creating challenges with staffing because it was hard to get that half day, um, a person that would work a half day. And so we transitioned over to, to $1,450 per, um, per ESL student. And so then there was a need for the ESL stipend. So we've been using the same pot of funds. We've just been changing the way we've been using that pot of funds. And so we, we decreased down to $1,200 per student so that we could free up some funds to go towards the ESL stipend. And we implemented that in the 2018-19 budget, I believe, Dr. Hinojosa. And so now this year, we, we have a lot of positions that are funded for the ESL program, but they're not actually funded out of ESL. And so the campuses weren't losing positions and we were careful if, if we had a campus that was at a point where they were a few thousand dollars because of the hundred dollar change, if they were a few thousand dollars away from holding on to a position or something like that, we made those exceptions. And so we had those discussions during the budget staffing meetings, but we're trying to right size that allocation so that we're meeting the compliance, but we're also meeting the needs of the students without causing harm to the campuses. And so by bringing it down to the 1100, that puts us more in line with the funding that we're receiving. And it's still allowing the campuses to have their staffing allocations as needed. But it's also just, like I said, right sizing the, the expenditure, the need and the funding, trying to get all those things aligned. And so that's what we've been doing over the last few years. But rest assured, we didn't, we didn't take any positions from the campuses or anything. And one comment we have gotten a lot of times is, we give them instructional materials money and they're like, okay, how can I use this money? So we've been trying to help them, you know, figure out the best way to use the dollars that they have to support the students in a supplemental capacity. So you, you have seen us kind of move that around a bit over the last few years, but overall the resources that are available to the campuses to support the needs of the students, that has not changed. Okay. So even on the second one where it says math coach position eliminated and the duty shifted to a new position better meet teacher support needs in a remote instructional environment. So we eliminated a math coach. We shifted the duties to a new position. Is that a brand new position or a new position on a different campus or at the administrative location? And did the data from the kids results indicate that we needed or could do that reduction or that shift support that shifting. So yes, I mean, it's never too. clear to me sometimes, you know, just what we've done here. I'll be happy to answer that, Mr. Durant. And um, I will, I'll be happy to provide even more detail. I thought I was probably too wordy this time, but I can do even better. I can provide even more next go round for you. So in, in particular with the math coaches and the literacy coaches, what we found was now that we've moved into blended learning, now that we've shifted into a remote instruction environment, the needs and support for teachers are different. The math coaches and literacy coaches physically walked from classroom to classroom and would be inside the room with the teacher providing support. In the blended learning model that we're going to, uh, you know, we're looking to put in, um, regardless of what the setting is, whether we're in the brick and mortar building all the time, part of the time, or none of the time, it will still be coming through um, a remote setting. And so to do so, the support that teachers need is different. And so it's not just in math and it's not just in literacy, it's across 
all of the content area, you, you saw the wonderful um, demonstration that we had from the elementary and the middle school teacher who were working inside of Schoology. And so there's an additional skill set and a level of support that we need to make sure that all of our teachers have now to make sure that they're effective in delivering the instruction through Schoology. And so that position, the digital learning coaches, still have all of their backgrounds in reading or in math or in science or whatever the core content area is, but now they're going to make sure that their focus is to help support the teachers in effective delivery of the instruction through the remote learning environment. Perfect, so that's perfect. why they're, it's not a matter of they went away, it's mm -hmm. a title change and a change in duties so that we can more effectively support our teachers in the brand new learning environment that we have for our students. And if you remember last year during the budget conversation, we had a lot of conversation about the coaches, the workforce coaches, and you had asked uh -huh. us to make sure that we evaluate that position to make sure that it's working and it's meeting the needs. And when we were at home for such a long period of time, it necessitated us to reevaluate that position to make sure we're using it, um, using the position and we're getting results for kids and teachers in that mind. That's positive. That's good. Mm -hmm. And so were we able to coach the Thank you. Thank uh, you. ones Thank we had you. on campus? to shift to remotely or do we have to make some changes? Well, we, we've had to make some changes. Um, part okay. of which was, you know, we have pended we have pending budget crisis looms. And so one of the things that I've shared with you all in the previous open meeting is we um, went through and asked the coaches, did they want, if you remember the conversation we talked yeah. about, we, yeah. we asked the coaches, do you want to secure a position in a, in a chapter 21 contracted position? Mm -hmm. Because if budget, if we have budget shortfalls, there's a possibility with a non um, contracted position that those positions could decrease. And so several of them transferred over to traditional classroom positions and some didn't, which helped us be able to necessitate and reformat that group, a much smaller group, um, to be able to focus in on what we're doing for the, uh, for the summer and the fall. That was helpful, thank you. The other thing that um, I wanna add to that is in terms of using a remote learning environment, physically when math coaches and literacy coaches were going into classrooms, they were limited to the number of teachers they could touch per day. Um, just in terms of space, distance, walking, getting in your car, driving to another site. Remotely, they can reach even more teachers. So it's you don't even need as many individuals as you had before because now you're able just with a click of a mouse to get into a class and be able to provide support to teachers. Then you can quickly move on to the next one. So they can provide support to even more teachers than if they are physically having to move around um, to do so. Okay. The other ones make sense. And then at Roberson, we added, what's the special program coordinator position? And reduce the CTE teachers from eight to seven. Dr. H, do you want to answer that one? Yes, thank you. So Ms. Durant, as you know, at, um, at Roberson, we have the pathways. And so um, one of the pieces that we did is we had an additional position that wasn't being used and we've created this coordinator position that will allow the opportunity to ensure that the students that are in or select a pathway can go through and fulfill the pathway all the way through. So this coordinator works with the alignment to ensure the students progress through the pathway, but the, this coordinator also works with the teachers. So, you know, we have a very diverse um, group of pathways there from the agriculture all the way to the um, um, performing and visual arts to the law pathway. So this coordinator also works with the teachers in ensuring that they're receiving their professional development as well as the resources. So no additional expense um, at Robertson, but really had the opportunity to create a position that would support the different pathways. Okay. I see a lot of these changes are at Ro at Robertson, um, Spring Leadership, Winchy. Is that because, why do we see more changes at certain campuses? Well, you're seeing a lot of the changes at Spring Leadership Academy and at Springwoods Village because it's the, we're going into the second year of those schools. And so we staffed them initially with 
with what we anticipated that the schools needed. But then as this first year unfolded, we were able to get feedback from the principals and from the teachers to more tightly align to what it is that would really provide them the support that they need in order to best meet the learning needs of the students. So that's what those adjustments are. Um, and, and that's why you see the, the bulk, I mean, I think maybe there are what, eight, 10 rows that are devoted to just the ch changes and tweaks that we had to make at Spring Leadership Academy and Springwoods Village. Um, in terms of, I think they're only, um, the Robertson ones are pretty much the same thing when we got into the new building and we had like, for example, with the head choir director, as we had more students um, with those beautiful rooms that we now have um, for performing and visual arts and particularly for our choir, the big choir loft, we had more kids that were interested in going into the choirs. And so of course we needed to, to add an additional person that was gonna really be able to help take care of all the kids who elected um, to go into the choirs. And so those were some of the adjustments that then needed to be made at Robertson as we were able to put them in a building that was really built for them to be able to fully service students with all that they had to offer. We had to make a couple of adjustments to make sure that we were meeting the capacity of the need as kids elected to go into certain areas. Thank you. That makes sense. We got fairly new campuses and we want to tweak it till we get it right. So, yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you for a, entertaining all my questions. No I have problem. a couple of questions. So this, this staffing guideline, uh, this represents, if we could fill this out at 100%, this represents the 87% of our budget that is payroll. Is that correct? The yes, staffing sir. guidelines plus the benefit cost. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So at, at any given time, Ed, what percentage of this are we in terms of FTEs? I, I imagine we're never at 100% of this guideline. What are we typically at? We usually budget somewhere between 95 and 97% because that's about our vacancy um, allotment that we have throughout the year. And it's not necessarily that a position goes unfilled all year long. It's just the one person leaves, there's a lag, another person comes, it's that sort of thing. So we do, we do definitely budget in for a lag um, in hiring and for that vacancy pool that we know we're going to have all throughout the year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This has been some good discussion. So I will now poll the board members for their vote to approve the 2020-2021 staffing guidelines as presented by the administration. Winfred Adams, Jr. Kelly P. Hodges. Madam President, did I miss the motion? Uh, no, ma'am, you did not. The motion was made by Deborah Jensen and second by Don Davis, and then there was discussion. Perfect, thank you. Uh huh. So, uh, it's late. Kelly it's late. <laughs> Kelly Hodges. I'm sorry, Ms. Hodges, we didn't get your vote. I didn't hear your vote. Ms. Hodges, can you unmute yourself? I think she got kicked off again. Okay. Did she vote? I, maybe I, she did and I didn't hear it. I didn't hear her vote and I think she okay. got disconnected. I will come back. Deborah Jensen? Aye. Justine Durant? Aye. Don Davis? Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse? Aye. I'm trying to get Ms. Hodges' attention. You're muted. That's it. I know I'm okay. So let me explain. I'm not, I want you to know I'm very educated and I've been on Zoom for the last 15 weeks, but something is going on. So I'm calling in on my cell phone and canceling the audio on the computer. But now 
I'm still on the computer and I'm not on the phone. So I don't know what's going on. So what did I miss? Do y'all need me to vote on something? We need to, <laughs> what you need? I'm sorry. What you need from me? Yes, ma'am, we do. We were mm -hmm. asking you to vote on the staffing guidelines uh, for 2020-2021 that we just uh, had the discussion on. Everyone. Right, and I did have the discussion, and Dr. Hill, I, I heard everything she said. It just went out at the end, so I, I, I agree. Okay. I. Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. There, uh, Chief Hill. Please yes. continue. So, uh, my final item of the night is bringing forth the 2020-2021 compensation manual, which is in accordance with board policy DEA local, um, that we bring the compensation manual um, also to the board of trustees to approve annually. And um, previously, you passed the, our, our increase for our teachers. And so we were already um, able to start loading those schedules in and get them ready. And so tonight, um, when you pass the, the remainder of the budget, um, we were able to then get your vote on uh, all the other positions, and now we'll be able to drop in all the tables and the formulas that we need for the calculations for all other employees. Um, and so um, we're bringing, um, it's, it's quite, quite a lift, and so um, we're bringing it forward. We're going to complete it for you and bring it back to you completed, the full manual, but we have all of the pay plans and everything already um, listed here that you can see for us to be able to um, to go ahead and drop those numbers in and complete the full manual. Any questions? Can uh, someone refresh my memory, and I know we looked at all of it, at what was an average um, increase we were able to provide to our paraprofessionals? Do we know? I know we It, We're doing the two and a half percent across the board, but I know we had a staffing study and wanted to make it more equitable and more in line with the market values. So I just, I can't remember how close we got. You know what? I can get it from you later. That's okay. We both were looking for it. The good thing about being in your office is all your stuff is here. Yes, <laughs> I, was hunt, here. I was hunting mine too. <laughs> Let's see if we, between Ann and I and Julie, we can find it. And I, I have my eyes on it. I'm just um, qualifying it before I say it. Okay. I know we, I got a lot of, um, I suppose, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, concern and then when we did our staffing study, it, it, it proved that we needed to make some changes. And, and I know we did everything that we possibly could with what we have. Just wanted to be able to speak to it intelligently at where we actually landed. Yes, ma'am. So of course it's a general pay increase is 2.5% of the control point and then equity adjustment. So with the total, the average raise is about 4% for paraprofessionals. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And where does that put uh, put them in comparison to other districts? That and I ask that because I do I do recall on the camp when we were campaigning that was every campaign meeting I attended that was an issue that was brought up. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is we, the TASB pay study looks at the 15 surrounding districts, establishes mm -hmm. the market rate, and market is anywhere between 90% and 110% of the market value. And so it gets them to the on market and then if, and at least 1% above in, in most instances. So it gets it, gets the positions aligned with the market and then 1% mm -hmm. and make sure that they're in the right pay range. And then if mm -hmm. they were at the minimum, if they just got on the pay range, but were at the minimum, an additional 1% was added. Okay, thank you. And in order to, um, to create the equity, it, the range, it, it really does 
depending on where you were individually. And so even the notifications that will go to employees will be very personalized and customized to where you started from and where we were able to get you to. And so there will be at the, the paraprofessional level, they're going to see some significant increases in terms of the equity that we had to, to put in place in order to bring people um, forward. That, that's a very good point, because when we do our raises with my staff, it shows the market value, it shows them where they are and what percentage they are of that value. And so we will give them that information as well. Um, they probably would get the detailed percentage, um, you know, when if they, they call in to inquire, they'll just get a general number from us um, when they okay. receive a notification. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that discussion. I will now entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees adopt the changes to the compensation manual for the 2020-2021 school year and authorize the superintendent or designee to make any additional changes as required or allowed by the budget. Madam President. I move that the Board of Trustees adopt the changes to the compensation manual for the 2020-2021 school year and authorize the superintendent or designee to make any additional changes as required or allowed by the budget. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Trustee Hodges. It's been moved by Winfred Adams, second by Kelly Hodges, that the Board of Trustees adopt the changes to the compensation manual for the 2020-2021 school year and authorize the superintendent or designee to make any additional changes as required or allowed by the budget. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, I will now poll the board members for their vote to adopt the changes to the compensation manual for the 2020-2021 school year and authorize the superintendent or designee to make any additional changes as required as are allowed by the budget. Winfred Adams, Jr. Aye. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Don Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, vote aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. The Board of Trustees will now recess this open session and convene in a closed meeting in accordance with Texas Open Meeting Act Section 551.071 for the purpose of a private consultation with the board's attorney on any or all subjects or matters authorized. Texas Open Meeting Act Section 551.072, for the purpose of discussing the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. Texas Open Meeting Act Section 551.074, for the purpose of considering the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee, or to hear complaints or charges against a public officer or employee. Texas Open Meeting Act, Section 551.076, to consider the deployment or specific occasions for implementation of security personnel or devices. No voting will take place in the closed meeting. Any action the board wishes to take as a result of discussions in the closed meeting will take place after the board reconvenes in open session. The time is now 9.39 p.m. Let's discuss during closed session. Are there any motions? Madam President, I move that the board issue a school district teaching permit to the following employee, Stephen Seltz, for the purpose of teaching non-core career and technology courses and to authorize the superintendent or designee to notify the commissioner of education of the board's action. 
Do we have a second? I second the motion. It's been moved by Winfred Adams Jr., second by Deborah Jensen, that the board issue a school district teaching permit to Stephen Seltz for the purpose of teaching non-core career and technology courses and to authorize the superintendent or designee to notify the commissioner of education of the board's action. I will now poll the board for their vote on this item. Winfred Adams, Jr. Aye. Aye. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Donald Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, aye. The motion carries unanimously. Are there any other motions? Since there are no other motions on tonight's agenda, I will now entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second, Trustee Hodge. Thank you. It's been moved by Justine Durant and second by Kelly Hodges that we adjourn our meeting for tonight. I will poll the board members for their vote. Winfred Adams, Jr. Aye. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Jenna Gonzalez. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, aye. The motion carries unanimously. There is no further business, so this meeting is officially adjourned at 1024 p.m. <laughs>